Welcome to CRM Audio, the Dynamics 365 podcast with Business Solutions MVPs George Dubinsky, Joel Lindstrom, and Sean Tabor. This week we're joined by Tabitha Shiver, and she's going to talk about a novel approach to change management when deploying Dynamics 365. But first, we wanted to thank our sponsors. This episode is sponsored by Kingsway Soft. Kingsway Soft is a leading integration solution provider offering software solutions that make data integration affordable and painlessly easy. Thousands of enterprise clients from over 65 countries and regions rely on Kingsway Soft to integrate data with various business systems in order to drive their business efficiency and fully leverage their information assets. Kingsway Soft is a leading provider of Microsoft Dynamics integration software, including Dynamics 365, CRM, AX, NAV, GP, SL, as well as many other applications such as Marketo, Dropbox, QuickBooks, and Salesforce. Whether you need one solution or several, Kingsway Soft works easily within the SSIS platform to make your integration processes as quick and easy as possible. Many of their clients have seen three to ten times greater integration performance after switching to the SSIS integration platform. And this episode is also sponsored by Alexa CRM. WordPress powers over 25% of all the websites on the internet, and it's a number one choice for blogs, websites, and portals. Because it's open source, simple to use, reliable, and extensible. Dynamics 365 has become a de facto standard in sales, marketing, customer service, and industry solutions. Now, WordPress and Dynamics can work together thanks to Dynamics CRM WordPress plugin built with love by the Alexa CRM team. Capture forms, engage your users and customers, all without writing any code. Control your site in WordPress while keeping your, your data in Dynamics 365. To build the plugin, Alexa CRM has created an open source Dynamics 365 PHP toolkit unlocking the world of Dynamics for PHP developers. Download your 30 day trial from alexacrm.com forward slash plugin and instantly create a portal by connecting Dynamics 365 and your WordPress sites. We thank Kingsway Soft and Alexa CRM for their support of CRM Audio. Joining us now on CRM Audio is Tabitha Shiver. Tabitha is the CRM Practice Director with Cloud9 Solutions, and Tabitha is based out of St. Louis. And I had the uh, pleasure of meeting Tabitha at CRM UG Focus a few weeks back, and she had a presentation about change management, specifically the psychology that people go through when they're implementing a system like CRM. A lot of times we talk about technology and and CRM audio, we talk a lot about the tools and all these great toys we have coming down to it, but at least half of the equation I've found is it's a people thing. It's it's changing. It's moving my cheese, whatever you want to say. So Tabitha, what's your background with change management and changing systems? So I uh, actually started out as a young professional in a sales role with with no uh, tool to manage accounts, and so I got interested in CRM, and I really started out as an angry beaver. Uh, I was real mad at the IT community at our company because they just didn't really meet my needs as an end user uh, when I wanted a, a specific tool. And so this set me on a, on a journey of uh, discovery and to try and see what it would take, you know, to really get the tools that I needed. And what happened along the way is I realized that uh, they just didn't really communicate with me. They didn't tell me why they couldn't meet my needs and, and provide me a tool or a system that I needed. And so um Ironically, I ended up on the other side of the table in, a, in an IT firm uh, developing CRM systems, and I, I quickly understood that I shouldn't have been mad at those IT administrators, right, because they were just doing the best that they could, and uh, it, implementations are huge, and, and there's a lot, of, a lot of moving parts and pieces and cost, and so um, having been on the other side, I, I really started to have empathy for both sides and that started my journey and so I started a lot of um, research and uh, being a consultant actually was on site with uh, many large organizations Um, I've done CRM implementations I've done um, records management uh, records retention projects Um, and the thing that that I've learned through all of them is that it is about the people at the end of the day you can build the best system in the whole wide world but if you don't 
empower them and if you don't give them the tools that they need, uh, they're not going to use it. And so I really started to look into a, a system called Prosy, which that involves ADCAR, which is taking a look from a change management perspective at, um, you know, is it because they don't have the ability? Do we need to just put training in place? Do we really just need to have more communication? And, and even going through that journey, I started to realize that we're dealing with people and there's actually a psychological component to any change that needs to occur. And so I started studying um, really the psychology. And uh, in, the, in that process, I came across two resources that I find incredibly useful and valuable. Uh, one of them was really Simon Sinek's um, book, The Start with the Why. And I love that he talks that about psychology, uh, the, the people don't buy from you or people don't um, engage with you because of the what they engage with you because of the why and so I started asking the question you know, why are we asking people to change why are people not using systems and um, and, and I, I in this development and, and asking this question a lot of it came down to fear or um, inadequacy or um, some of it was just you know I need the training uh, but but a lot of it was really these really kind of deeper, uh, more psychology kind of based issues. And uh, in my studies, I came across something called the Kubler-Ross change curve. And it, it's used um, really for kind of grief counseling. And if, if somebody loses somebody, that you kind of go through this, this standard set of emotional responses anytime there's going to be a transition or a change in your life. And I started thinking, this is exactly what's going on in any sort of user adoption issue, right? In any sort of technology rollout, you've got people who 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 hear first and foremost, um, you know, hey, we're going to make this change. So I've, uh, in a CRM sense, think of uh, this the common situation, right, where you've got an older workforce, and these gentlemen are used to writing their notes about their accounts or their clients on their little notepad or in their Excel document or whatever way it is that they're used to doing. And somebody comes in and says, hey, we're going to um, make this awesome new system for you that you don't really think you even need necessarily, and you're going to start doing things a new way. Well, their first response is, what? I mean, they write, they go into this this shock moment. Have you have you uh, experienced? Yes, that absolutely. Oh, I've never absolutely. I've never heard I've never heard CRM implementations equated with death before. But I, now I see your point. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, and so you're immediately like, like, uh, okay, uh, I I don't I, I don't know what to do with this. I, I'm, um, I'm I'm shocked, and then they typically go into denial. So no, no way, this can't be happening, or disbelief, right? Oh, we've heard this before, right? Your your uh, leadership team always has these great ideas. It's never going to really happen. It's not going to come to fruition. This is just another one of those harebrained ideas they have, right? And so the, this is the denial stage. This is also the stage where you hear things like, well, that system's great for everyone else, but I'm the top earner in the organization, so I'm not going to have to use it. Right, we heard that one. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we've heard we've heard all those before. <laughs> Especially, you're right. The older you, know, you the people who are comfortable with the, with the current status quo, and you know, well, the business may have good reasons for for bringing the system in. You know, having the users say, "I'm comfortable with what I do. I don't know what's in it for me." Exactly, and it's ironic that you say that because what's in it for me is exactly the name of the uh, presentation that I did at, at Focus, and that's um, what I think that. Us as, as as change management specialists and people who are really focusing even on user adoption need to be thinking about is what is in it for them and so um, I do have a, a a methodology for getting there and if you're interested in that we um, I'll be at fo uh, I'm sorry at summit in October and uh, doing the what's in it for me but that's a whole other segment so. Let's get back to the Kubler-Ross change curve. So after denial, after they decide, you know, this isn't for me, I shouldn't have to do this, at some point somebody, either carrot or stick, says, yeah, you're, you are going to do this. And this is typically where people get really frustrated. So um, 
they've admitted <laughs> that there's going to there's going to have to be a change and this is where you're going to get that the system doesn't work this isn't formatted you don't understand my job and um, just a lot of frustration around technology um, this is where a lot of the training needs to start happening and and to be um, being done you know as frequently as possible in this stage and then the next stage on the change curve and I don't know if this is really true <laughs> because I've never seen anyone go into an all-out state of depression but if you if you do uh, put this analogy with like grief counseling people do get to a state where they really get down and they really get sort of depressed and they they begin to think um, man, I just don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I'm smart enough. And this is uh, where the, a lot of the self-doubt comes into play. And, and I think in terms of organizations, we don't always address this. There's some sense that we're all adults and we need to um, be able to handle our own emotional baggage. But the truth of the matter is we're all people, right? And at the end of the day that we come to work and um, you can't separate whether you feel nervous or worried that you might uh, not be able to accomplish a task that you're getting paid to do. And so um, while, while I don't think people go into all-out depression, I do think that um, there is a, a kind of a low point on the curve when, when you're frustrated and you kind of just want to give up. And, and shortly, do, go ahead. Do you think, Tabitha, that, that sometimes that, that uh, it's masked in more resentment than depression, especially from... Um, maybe high producers who have their own niche way of implementing a process, but the organization as a whole didn't adopt that, you know, step by step. So, yeah, I, I've definitely seen that. I think that's a little bit more in the frustration phase, which is which is just a little bit before that. Um, and I think this is where this is probably where most implementations uh, kind of go awry, right? Is because th when those people get, um, they have the power, they they get that frustration and they get resentful, is when the leadership starts to question, mm, is this really going to happen? Is this really going to work? Mm -hmm. I, think, I think the depression. Heart. And I, I don't even like to call it depression, but the, the like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can do this stage mm -hmm. comes, comes after the uh, leadership has said, I, you know, I kind of don't care how great of an earner you are, you're going to do this. And I don't think this is something that you actually see. Like, I don't think a lot of times there's a physical manifestation of this within the workplace. This is probably the conversation that's going on behind the scenes with their spouse or one, with one of their coworkers. Because they're not. This isn't something they're typically going to admit to their to their bosses or to their um, co uh, um, managers or somebody on, on the implementation team. Does that make sense? It does. I I have had uh, a couple implementations, especially in financial services, where if there's a, a top producer that's unhappy, they are vocal. So <laughs> I've kind of felt like it's been a bit of a physical manis manifestation of my, of itself. But uh, yeah, but the the point's valid. So, and so they will be vocal in the frustration phase. Um, the, I think the depression phase is more of the internal self-doubt and the worry of, I don't know if I can do this. Or the, um, or, or it could even be a little bit of the ego of, I shouldn't have to do this. So maybe that's you know, where we're, we're saying the resentment piece. So yeah, but definitely somewhere, right. somewhere in those, those phases. After that, we typically um, find that people say, okay, I'm going to start giving this a try, right? I'm going to start experimenting. And this is, we've all heard, right? Get the, get the small wins. So if you can get them just to do one little thing in the system, if you can find that one value add, that one what's in it for them, if you can find those small wins, those, that moves them into that experimental stage. And this is where they kind of start to say, you know what, okay, this isn't so bad after all. I'm going to at least give it a chance. This is a time when they're really trying to learn a new skill, though. And so I think about this in terms, in this stage, I think of it a lot like my kids, right? When they were learning to walk, when they were two years old, I didn't get mad at them for falling down because they were getting up and falling down and getting up and falling down. And I knew where they were in this process, right? And so I, I knew that they were very early on. And so they were at an experimental stage. And so I had to support them and continue to pick them up and lift them up. And so there will be a phase in your project where you'll you'll have to go through that. And, and you need to have empathy for those people to realize 
they're kind of trying this on for the first time. And, and the difficult part, especially as you're, as you're um, doing a deployment or you're an IT admin or even a business leader in this, is that you've actually already had time to go through this process and through this curve. And so uh, what you have maybe been thinking about or working on for, you know, three months, six months, a year already, these people are kind of, you know, at that at that beginning stage from a maturity level of, of being asked to do something new. So in that experimental stage, if people can really uh, have empathy and really say, okay, you know, we don't expect you to get everything overnight and realize that people need to hear things um, anywhere from nine to 12 times before it really sinks in. Um, so this is, again, this is the stage when you really need that ongoing support. And I think that this is where organizations a lot of times think in terms of the project has a beginning and an end. The end is typically the go-live date, right? But after go-live, there is still this whole phase where people need the support and they need to be shown over and over again and they need to have outlets and they need to have um, super users that they can go to and that they can ask for help as they're in this experimental stage. And as they go through the experimental stage and they continue to have little successes and little wins, they gain more and more confidence. And the more confidence that they get, the more likely they are to use the system. And then they can actually have that confidence and they can say, yes, all right, this is my system. Now I know what I'm supposed to do. Now I know how to do it. Now I've integrated it into my everyday business. And that is when they really start to become um, advocates for the project and to they can move into the role of being leaders and super users and things along those lines. So that really just explains the curve. Um, do you guys have any questions or thoughts about that? Well, how, how do you find that in that in that curve throughout for cha for effective change management you really need that communication to be consistent throughout all those stages to help help get those users and those big stakeholders through that process right absolutely how do you find um the commitment or the or the additional change management that's needed on a on an executive level to keep them on message to maintain that message so, I mean, ex executives absolutely need to be communicated to just as much as end users do. But I think the thing that you have to think about from a communication standpoint, especially with executives, is that they're very busy and they um, – they have a lot of competing priorities on both their mind share and on their time. So I recommend from a communication standpoint on executive communications that you keep them significantly shorter, but honestly, probably more frequent. And I would also change the method in which you communicate. Um, executives tend to do better if you have a conversation or it's verbal um, in, in kind of or a face-to-face -face meeting if and when possible um, but keep them very very brief right so if you can do change management by, by doing the good old walkthrough method where you go and and it's a uh, it's have a conversation give a reminder you're more likely to get them engaged in training sessions or in email communications that you send out I get the, you know, I, I definitely can see the parallels between the Kubler Ross and the stages of change management. Um, but I would say, do you have to go through all those stages? Cause I can, I can think of examples where people were scared at the beginning, but then they quickly accepted it. And, you know, by what I would say is, can you mitigate some of those stages with proper communication? So I'll give you an example. You know, a lot of times that grief is really frustration and feeling, you know, I've worked here for 30 years and I can't, they, they aren't listening to me, but if you make them feel like you're listening to them, you involve them earlier in the process, get their input, give them early reviews to, to soften the blow. You can change them from the grief to the excitement. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what change management is all about, right? It's, it's identifying where people are in, in which stage and what needs to be communicated to them and what the message needs to be. And so um, I think everybody goes through all the stages, but to your point, I think they go through them very quickly when their basic needs are being met. And so... Um, a lot of times, if you just, if anybody out there just wants like the, the, the simplest answer, uh, a lot of times just 
putting attention to it and creating the awareness of it is a great first step. So if you can let people know, hey, you are going to be frustrated in this process. We've seen it time and time again. Here's what to expect. Know that that is normal and that is okay and that there are all these resources here when you do feel frustrated. Uh, you are setting yourself up for success um, more so than failure or, or and people sometimes say oh I don't want to I don't want to say that because I don't want to create fear or I don't want to create um, uh, the, the the possibility that that people are going to talk badly about this project but if you can proactively mitigate that by saying hey here's what to expect we've seen it time and time again here are your outlets it, uh, it it lets people know that that you've thought it through that you're an expert and that you really do care about where they are and that you're going to meet them uh, with the tools and techniques that they need in their time of frustration and then they know where to go and so they're ha not having the water cooler conversation um, they're, they're going right to the resources that you give them so that's a great point thank you how can people find more I mean do you have any blogs or or anything where you you write on this topic yes I've actually been doing some blogging on our um, our parent company's website is pa-group.us and uh, my Twitter handle is at Tabitha S. So you're more than welcome to follow me there as well. And then I will be speaking at CRM User Group Summit in October. I think it's October 10th through 13th in Nashville, Tennessee. In Nashville. Bring your cowboy hat. Absolutely. And the, the conversation there is going to be the what's in it for me. Uh, and the really there will be a hands-on exercise where we're going to really think about the changes that uh, an organization is being asked to make and helping you as leaders identify what is in it for you so that you guys, as you're going through this process of change, um, have everything that you need to, 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 to push through um, when you're trying to guide your users through this process as well. And we'll talk a lot about motivation, um, kind of what the what I call the five P's to success, and um, how you can apply some of these um, change management principles within your organization. Okay, great, great. We'll look forward to you. I'll be there as well as will Sean, and I don't know about George. He might be there too. If you have any additional questions, you can reach me at my email address, which is tabitha.shever at pa-group.us. This has been CRM Audio, the Dynamics 365 podcast with business solutions MVPs George Dubinsky, Joel Lindstrom, and Sean Tabor. This podcast is a production of Dynamic Podcasts, LLC. Follow us on Twitter at CRM Audio. Subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn, or any place else that fine podcasts are available. You can email us at voice at crm.audio with questions or topic suggestions. Special thanks again to our sponsors, Kingsway Soft and Alexa CRM, and thanks to Dale Simmons for, for providing our music. 